name is Leanna Levine Reisner, and I am the network director of Plant Powered Metro New York, which is a community based organization that's committed to our collective health empowerment through whole food, plant based nutrition, which is an evidence based approach to nutrition that can prevent, treat, and even reverse chronic illness. While we normally prefer to offer live sessions to build community around health and nutrition, we're offering this program as part of a web series during this season of COVID-19. We're really glad you've come to connect with us today and to learn with us and to mark Earth Week with us with this special program. Um, I wanna invite each of you to share about yourselves in the chat box so we know uh, where you're coming from and maybe what your interests are in this area. Um, we are going to be talking about the food choices that heal both people and planet. And I'm very thrilled to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Wendy Sachs, who will be leading a conversation with our guest presenters, Joanne and Martin. Um, and just uh, in terms of logistics, we'll be taking questions in the chat box that I'll be monitoring throughout the program. Most questions we'll take at the end, um, but I may interject in the middle um, with questions as we go. So Wendy, take it, take over from here. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Wendy Sachs and I'm very privileged to be on the board of Plant Power Metro New York. So um, welcome everyone. And I couldn't be more excited about our two guests tonight and also this presentation in uh, honor of Earth Day. Um, most of the people or many of the people in our community are um, uh, have come into this world primarily through um, health concerns and and health issues, and um, we really wanted to widen the scope in uh, bringing in our uh, sisters and brothers, cousins in this movement, which is of course the um, animal compassion and animal rights and the environmental issue, and also widen the aperture in not just what an individual can do, but what's going on in the policy and systemic systemic world as well. So um, I will start in one minute to introduce, uh, if somebody could mute, I'm hearing some background noise. Um, maybe that's better. Okay, great. So uh, I woke up this morning and I pulled out a book uh, of poems. It's my favorite. And I found one that couldn't be more appropriate for our speakers. So I'm introducing them by way of a poem called to be of use. And I'm not gonna read the whole thing, I'm just picking out three of the stanzas. It's a poem by Marge Piercy, it says, to be of use. The people I love the best jump into work head first without dallying in the shallows and swim off with short strokes almost out of sight. They seem to become natives of that element, the black sleek heads of seals bouncing like half submerged balls. I love people who harness themselves, an ox to a heavy cart, who pull like water buffalo with massive patience, who strain in the mud and muck to move things forward, who do what has to be done again and again. And then there's other stanzas and she concludes, the work of the world is as common as mud, botched, it smears the hands, crumbles to dust. But the thing worth doing well but the thing worth doing well done has a shape that satisfies clean and is evident. Greek amphoras for wine or oil, Hopi vases that held corn are put in museums, but you know that they were made to be used. The pitcher cries for water to carry and a person for work that is real. So our guests tonight couldn't be doing more real work in the world. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Joanne Kong, who advocates for plant-sourced nutrition, raising ethical awareness that greater compassion for animals and our planet are vitally necessary for transformative growth and positive world change. She has been a speaker at numerous vegan festivals, universities, and conferences, including international appearances in Germany, Italy, Spain, Norway, Canada, and India. Dr. Kong is author of If You Ever Loved an Animal, Go Vegan, is featured in the new book, Legends of Change, about vegan women changing the world. She will appear in the upcoming documentary, Eating Our Way to Extinction, and her TED Talk, The Power of Plant-Based Eating, has over 770,000 worldviews. 
In addition to her animal and an environmental advocacy work, she's a critically acclaimed classical concert pianist and teaches at the University of Richmond in Virginia. And our uh, second guest, or other guest, complimentary guest, is Martin Rowe, who is a senior fellow at Brighter Green, an international public policy action tank based in New York City. He's the author, most recently, of a policy paper, Beyond the Impossible, The Futures of Plant-Based and Cellular Meat and Dairy. Martin is also the co-founder of Lantern Publishing and Media, which specializes in books on animal rights and veganism. He lives in Brooklyn, and I will say Martin has also published many other articles and papers, and you can find uh, more information about him also on the website brightergreen.com, or brightergreen.org, excuse me. So um, the question I have for both of you is here we are in COVID-19. Um, what is COVID-19 teaching us? Oh, gosh, I, I first of all would like to thank Wendy and Vivian and Liana and Plant Powered uh, Metro New York. This is such uh, a challenging time that we're all going through right now. And I thank you for making this event possible. Um, and COVID-19 is teaching us so much. It's become this serious wake up call where we need to examine our place in the world. We can't continue this, what I call an egocentric view of the world, that the Earth's resources are inexhaustible and its inhabitants expendable. So we really have reached a point where humans have uh, wreaked the greatest damage upon the planet and a tremendous this paradigm shift is necessary, a dramatic shift in the way that we conduct our lives. And I think that this virus is serving as a catalyst and, and humankind were faced with the opportunity to make positive changes. The most important thing, moving away from the exploitation of animals. I don't need to go in the, into the whole history of all the pandemics, you know, the Spanish flu, SARS, MERS, avian flu, these pathogenic uh, diseases that are happening now all around the world. And a lot of people I notice in the public, they're talking about, yes, we need to shut down the animal wet markets and that kind of thing. But the general public is not talking about, hey, how about factory farms? We need to look at this seriously. And I think that's the most challenging part for us advocating for plant-based nutrition and animal rights is that we need to take this as a point of opportunity to really make a difference and move away from animal exploitation. It's, it really comes down to the nature of our relationships with other living beings on the planet. Um, because if, if one being is damaged, it damages us all because we are all connected. We're all part of this planetary organism. Some people call it Gaia, if you want to call it that. So I think it, it's a huge challenge for us. Um, and I think another thing, this sort of ties in with human nature. We tend to be reactive. You know, something happens in terms of climate change, a disastrous event or what we're facing now, we tend to be proactive instead of preventive. And the same goes, of course, with health, right? Um, a lot of people, there's, there's profit in disease, right? But there's not profit in, in being healthy in the first place. So we need to shift the paradigm in terms of personal health as well. And I know your organ, organization does that beautifully. So that's kind of an overview of uh, what 19 is teaching us. <laughs> Martin. Uh, yeah, I, well, this is a very teachable moment. Uh, you don't want to make a crisis into a teachable moment. It's just default, unfortunately, a teachable moment. I think what's instructive to us is that we have been getting these clear teachable moments when in regards to climate change, right? We've seen Superstorm Sandy. We've seen the drought in the Western states, which is now a mega drought. We have seen the great fires across Australia and in California and in Russia and elsewhere. So we are seeing instances of catastrophic climate change. 
And now we're seeing a further example of what is likely to be further exacerbated by climate change. And that is the spread of zoonotic diseases. And so this is really an opportunity to recognize a dry run for what, whether the world is ready to act in concert and ultimately to change the systems by which it has come to the place of crisis and whether it will perpetuate those systems of crisis or not. And so I totally agree with Joanne. We need a, a, a completely reimagined food system. We need to recognize, and I think this is really the important thing here as well, is that this notion that wild animals and the natural world is somehow now distinct from domesticated animals and those animals that are appropriately considered to be uh, grown for food is, is falling apart. Uh, obviously, the issues surrounding intensive animal agriculture, growing feedstock, feed crops, weak soy corn for animals and the devastation to the rainforests and various other um, forested ecosystems, as well for grazing and all of the aspects of industrial animal agriculture are now coming into elucidation because it's, it's clear that the issues surrounding the sources of these, these various diseases, which are uh, wild animals of various kinds are caused by either a our intrusion into their natural habitat whether for grazing timber or mining they are a consequence of our placing domesticated animals and wild animals in proximity or wild animals of different species in proximity and the third thing is that we are industrially farming wild animals so given all of, and the fourth thing is that we are industrially farming domesticated animals in a situation whereby zoonotic diseases can easily spread. So all of it, Ebola, SARS, MERS, green monkey disease, HIV, H1N1, H5N1, you name it, they all come about because of this breakdown of some kind of um, distinction between our habitat and human habitat, our habitat and the natural habitat. So we really need to examine that uh, because we know that diseases are civilizationally changing. They have been since the very beginning. In fact, diseases are a consequence of civilization. It's because of our domestication of animals and the settlements of humans in dense populations that allows these diseases to happen. So this really is an example of what we need to completely rethink. And while we may not be able to rethink civilization, we can at least rethink the way we place animals of various kinds in our human context. So at the very macro picture, that is a huge lesson that we all have to learn. Mm -hmm. um, Joanne, did you want to comment further on that in particular, or I'll ask another question? It's interesting to note when you look at the history of how humans have interfaced with other animals that really no epidemic diseases occurred until about 10,000 years ago. And it was about 10,000 years ago that the herding of animals began, where we started commodifying animals, we became in closer contact with them. And this rise in um, zoonotic disease really kind of took off roughly in the 60s or 70s, which is an interesting point again, like Martin was pointing out. Um, that's when the industrialized factory farming uh, business really took off. And so this, this idea, I love this statement of, of Dr. Greger. I listened to one of his recent talks and he was saying to think that every animal in a factory farm is like a test tube to brew up the next plague. So by reducing pandemic risk, by moving towards a plant-based diet, we will greatly reduce, if not stop, the flow of new viruses. So we need to see industrial factory farming for what it is, a menace to public health. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, and on that, um, so we have seen uh, a number of um, these uh, uh, I can't think of the word, the um, aid uh, that the government has been um, 
doling out, going uh, more towards corporations. And at the same time, in some of the very local communities, for those who've been able to have access to that, the um, there has been a rise in the local farm, uh, people, sub, you know, um, going to their local farmers market and getting vegetables and um martin i know that you work more on you know because these these issues are so big and even within the vegan movement we've been a little bit separated from one another even there's an even though there's an awareness of it all um what is happening on the um sort of organizational level i know when we spoke originally or a little bit earlier you talked about points that were happening in a press release and various different organizations that were on board with that. Could you take us through that? Yeah, so descending from the Olympian height of 10,000 years of agriculture and, and civilization's founding, we get to the other lesson, which I think is te COVID is teaching us, which is what is the where value in our society fully lies? And we're seeing that we with the health workers, with the delivery people, with the bus drivers, with the subway drivers. As the, the infrastructure of a, a society dependent upon service industries is very strong. We're seeing that. We're also seeing acutely inequities in our society over who is exposed because of the nature of their work and who is more likely to suffer because of underlying conditions including chronic conditions, comorbidities that are making death much more likely, of which one of them is obesity. So one of the fundamental things that needs to, it needs to change is not simply the food system at an international level and our commodity crop driven, uh, just in time inventory supply chain where everything is calibrated to the finest degree in order to make sure that the chicken is exactly four pounds at being slaughtered and not five pounds or three pounds so that the weight of the chicken doesn't remove the knife from the throat so everything can go through the industrial system. But also uh, to the fact that we need to make sure that our communities, especially those communities who have been historically deprived of them, have access to fresh fruit and vegetables, to healthy foods, to preventative medicine, to a whole range of health modes that allow them to be uh, able to do their work without experiencing the devastation that is coming to them because of this COVID-19. And that applies to all of us. It's a crisis of public health in the United States. So it was with that in mind that Brighter Green, in collaboration with the Center for Biological Diversity, wrote to uh, both leaders, uh, majority and minority of the Houses of Congress, and asked them with the first tranche of $2 trillion to concentrate on local and small and medium-sized farms, to emphasize the importance of plant-based diets, to shift agriculture away from commodity monocultures towards a much more biodiverse and bioregional ecosystem, and to do so through the lens of social justice, particularly for people who have been historically deprived of these areas, poor communities, communities of color, particularly urban communities, but not only urban communities. And what was significant is that Brighter Green and Center for Biological Diversity got 52 other organizations to sign on to this letter. Not only the animal rights organizations like Mercy for Animals and Farm Sanctuary, but alliances of nurses for a healthy environment, the Farm Worker Association of Florida, the Government Accountability, Project, the North Carolina Environmental Justice Group, the Center for Progressive Reform, World Animal Protection, the Food Chain Workers Alliance. So this is an example of the, another lesson that COVID teaches us, which is that nobody can act alone. If we are going to change this system, we need coalition building, multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder coalitions. And this is an example of where the environmentalists and the animal advocates and the public health experts, the food justice work and workers' rights alliances, as well as those people who want good governance and accountability on a national and regional and state and local level can come together. So this is another opportunity that this crisis shows us because it's showing us, in, if, if it wasn't showing us before, it was showing us now that climate change and zoonotic pandemics are not local issues. <laughs> they mm -hmm. need to have a systemic, a 
analysis and to stop them they need to have a systemic response excellent um joanne um on that level it seems one of the themes we had talked about was um to some extent the simplicity like even though there's so much complexity in all of this the solutions um uh, seem simple only in the sense that basic biology is simple you know rel relatively simple like if we stop eating animals and if we um go back to you know the plant world like nothing needs to suffer really for us to be healthy for animals to live a rightful life and for the planet to begin healing um can you take us into what some of those outcomes might be or sort of what's happening now and what also needs to happen on the ground to have that be a wider message um i first started doing this this activity in terms of vegan advocacy about five years ago and and seeing how the movement has grown so much over just past the past few years and trying to look on the bright side of things it's like this has given us the opportunity to promote that even further to say we need to look long term and re-examine what we're doing with food production with innovation uh the possibility of cultured meat the plant-based market and alternative uh alternatives to, to meat products of course the whole plant-based market is exploding we have a tremendous opportunity to do that there um and then I, also it's it's wonderful to imagine that um, we see this, of course, in the news all the time. It's like, let the scientists speak, right? We're, we're seeing the positive aspect of what humans, what we've done with technology and scientific developments, and that is something that we can actually celebrate, you know, that we can actually, through our innovation, through scientific research, make even more progress in terms of, of different ways of agriculture, regenerative agriculture, food development, um, all the way to you know, finding alternative means for energy, um, looking at communication. If one thing we've learned um, through this crisis is thank goodness we can communicate with each other, right? I mean, maybe it's something we've taken for granted, but now it's, it's like, Thank, you know, thank goodness we're able to, to share information around the globe quickly. We're able to stay in touch with our loved ones. So I think that's another thing that, that in a way we're pushing the envelope and continuing to develop those capabilities with communication. So that's actually, I think, something positive that's coming out of all this. Martin uh, already mentioned about um, different types of, of you know, regenerative agriculture, veganic farming is another one, increase in organic farming. Just in the past couple months, just down the street in the neighborhood where I live, there's this huge corner of the block that's, that's a community garden. So we're going to see more emphasis on producing our food locally, um, healthy plant-based food. Um, and also as a university professor, seeing all the methods of online education, some methods which are good and some which are not. So we're going to see more improvements and better expanded ways to educate outside of the classroom. And then another thing I think that this crisis has taught us since we're sheltering at home and spending a lot of time um, indoors, it's in a way, in a healthy way, caused us to go inside and reflect, to slow down, to think about the things that we value in our lives. I don't know if any of you are experiencing that at all, um, that chance to, to really think about what, what is important to you, meditate, do yoga, um, all of those ways of developing the inner soul. and. Uh, it was just great at seven o'clock hearing all of you uh, outside doing the celebration of, of the frontline workers. We're seeing um, a celebration of 
what is so important to us as human beings, to any sentient being, it's that sense of compassion, that sense of connection, that, that we see the best of, of who we are, how we're helping our neighbors, how we're fostering relationships, being in touch with people we've been out of contact with for a long time. So I, I think that that's reminded us about the importance of our relationships, that there's a real need to centralize within ourselves what is most important in our lives. Mm -hmm. And I would say we've all learned how to really clean our hands, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I love what you said about communication and also, um, you know, the the compassion. Um, I do want to point out also on Brighter Green, there's a magnificent article um, written on really seeing, really seeing animals. And it's like what you're saying. It's very easy for me to have you know, a um, heart as wide open as the world to my cat, or in another case, somebody's dog. But we don't often, those who are still eating the animals, make that connection um, that the cow, um, you know, the chicken, you know, the, they, they are also uh, deserving of our love and not, uh, not to be eaten if we don't need to eat them. Uh, Martin, um, also what you said about communication is so important. Um, this uh, press release had, uh, you, you're working on this press release now, right, to go out with the 52 other sign signatories? Uh, no, the press release is gone. It's been sent it's out gone. on April the 15th, yes. Excellent. And what are the expected outcomes? So now you have actually mobilized um, these major uh, systemic organizations, like we're used to just mobilizing our kitchens, basically in this uh, side of the world, getting getting our refrigerators well stocked. Uh, you're working at you know a national and global scale. Can you walk us through some of that? Well, it's a press release, and it's about COVID nineteen, so it has marginally more likelihood of being picked up by somebody than a press release on animal rights. So that's one thing we can, might expect. I mean, I think probably the chances of anything happening within the larger federal government are slim. As you may know, not only has a disproportionate amount of that first those two trillion dollars already gone to propping up farmers that were already being supported because of the uh, the U.S.'s trade war with China twice. Uh, so they're getting another payout in order to sustain their unsustainable businesses. These farmers have also uh, been promised that the federal government will uh, buy uh, meat and dairy in large amounts to allow them to keep on going. The uh, government is still pressing industry to increase line speeds for chickens in order to make it possible to slaughter three chickens a second, which will obviously not only uh, do terrible things to the animal's welfare, make it much more likely that some chickens will not be electrocuted by the time they get to have their throats cut. But also, of course, it puts the workers, the workers who are currently at high risk of suffering repetitive injury, as well as being exposed to COVID-19, it will allow that, it will make their lives even worse. And the most uh, difficult job in the United States, even more difficult. Many of those workers are undocumented and poor and uh, people of color. And, and it is those people who are also part of the food chain and are commonly ignored. Perhaps most interesting to us is the reality that when people think of farming, um, they, I'm gonna give you a link here that you will find interesting. Um, when you think of farming, and this is actually a specific statement in the, in the United States, the words used to describe anything other than cotton, tobacco, meat, dairy, is specialty products, specialty foods. That includes fruit, vegetables, nuts, everything else apart from all of those other foods. In those other foods are included grain, and the grain is there to feed the animals. So the irony is that when we talk about farming in the United States, we actually don't mean anything to do with specialty foods. 
It's an entirely commodity crop and animal-based notion of what farming is. So that's where we are when it comes to a federal level. But the purpose of this letter was actually to do something I think a little more uh, useful generally, and that is to show that coalitions of organizations that have previously siloed their work and have found several ways to disagree with one another have now come together because there is something much more important that is at stake here. And that is the fundamental right of people to live without being threatened by a pandemic disease. Mm -hmm. So we have a real opportunity to gather coalitions and to make a difference. That on the federal level might be extremely hard with this administration. Um, it really will need a different administration and a different uh, interior secretary and a different whole set of cabinet in order to shift things. But uh, that is, I think, the purpose, ultimate purpose of this letter. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the local level, in New York City level, it's a very, very exciting time. And I could talk about that a little later. But uh, that Yes, was, I mean, uh, actually, this would be a good time to talk about it because I'm going to start. Uh, we have about 10 more minutes to before we shift into some questions um, that we'll take from the chat line. But um, yes, what is happening in New York and, and shifting into... Um, Joanne, maybe you can then pick up on this and what, what can individuals do, um, particularly, let's say, individuals in this community or, or individuals at large? So, shall I start? Yes. Yes, okay. go ahead. All right. Yeah. So, Brighter Green, or my, I in particular, as part of Brighter Green, are on the, is on the environmental working group of the Good Food Purchasing Program, New York City. And the Good Food Purchasing Program is a program that came out of the Good Food Purchasing Administration, uh, which is based in Los Angeles and attempts to get municipalities to agree to uh, set baseline standards for public purchasing in those municipalities along five different key sectors. The first one is nutrition. The food is, must be nutritious. Secondly, the food must be sustainably grown. Thirdly, the chain of workers from picking the food or growing the food all the way through to the delivery of the food in whatever way it's delivered must have their rights maintained and work in proper, safe, healthy, viable working conditions. The fourth one is that the businesses that are supported are small or medium-sized predominantly with an orientation to women-owned and people of color. And the fifth one is that the animal welfare standards should be high. And one way to maintain animal welfare standards is just to buy less meat and dairy. So that's a very interesting set of metrics. The idea being that you establish baseline standards for all of these places, and then over the next few years, of these sectors over the next few years, you, you increase and, and get, make those standards better. So municipalities around the nation have passed legislation to establish their own good food purchasing programs. So Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, Boston, Washington, D.C., Miami, Cincinnati, uh, Cook County, Illinois, and now New York City is on the verge of doing the same thing. And what it does is it establishes uh, uh, the largest market in the United States. A billion dollars of food is purchased in New York City for the Department of Education, the Department of Corrections, the Department of Health and Human Services, etc. And the idea is to instantiate from in all of these different sectors a, a progressive movement towards healthy, local, sustainable, high welfare food. And even though the most difficult, unsurprising to everybody here, the most difficult standard to set is the animal welfare standard, the fact that you can access your animal welfare standards and improve them by just buying fewer animal products is a very exciting thing. Now, of course, Eric Adams knows all about the, uh, Eric Adams, Borough, Brooklyn Borough President, who's running for mayor in 2021. He knows all about the Good Food Purchasing Program and Corey Johnson, who's the current speaker of the House, uh, excuse me, of the City Council, who is also running for mayor, 
has also embraced the Good Food Purchasing Program, as has the current mayor, Bill de Blasio. And even though they have embraced different facets of it, so it's more a good food purchasing program as opposed to the good purchasing program, the great thing about the mayoral election next year is that you will have at least two candidates who are going to outcompete one another to emphasize the importance of all of these aspects of healthy, nutritious, locally raised, raised sustainably harvested, uh, food justice oriented food. In fact, Corey Johnson recently released a good food purchasing program, uh, sorry, a, a document from the council about food equity in which he emphasized the importance of growing fresh food, fruits and vegetables oriented in schools, fresh. I mean, you know, properly made there. No, re no packaged food, no processed food. This is food grown in schools. So that is on a local level in New York City. And New York City is a very big place. So this is a real opportunity for all plant-based advocates to get incredibly involved in this. So check out the Good Food Purchasing Program, pay attention to your city council and where they stand on passing this and seeing if they can go. Boston residents also want to vote for Eric Adams. Boston has an incredibly progressive Good Food Purchasing Program. So you can try and find any city council member in Boston to run for mayor. So there you are. So um, this is all very good news. And, you know, since um, the health side, you know, as individual health is, of course, about health and healing um, for our group listening, you know, this is about not only healing yourself and your family, but clearly our communities. And even if we can't quite reach the federal government at this point, we can, as uh, Joanne was also saying, do more in our uh, local communities and more politically. Um, Joanne, do you want to add anything in terms of what individuals can do now um, to affect the greater change? Yes. So in terms of community, some of these things we've already talked about, I read that the Brooklyn Queens Animal Save um, is circulating a petition. I don't know if you've seen it to shut down the wet markets, the 80 wet markets in New York. Um, uh, various change.org and moveon.org uh, petitions are going around. Um, and there are other organizations too, such as there's the Restaurant Opportunity Center's United Disaster Relief Fund, where uh, you can donate to help restaurant workers that have been impacted by coronavirus, giving to the local food bank. There's also direct relief that provides PBE for health workers. Um, there's even uh, programs for kids like First Book, which is to provide educational materials for children that can't be in school. Another organization is called No Kid Hungry. Um, also, there's Community Solidarity, which is actually America's largest all vegan hunger relief food program. So even though we're a uh, sheltered home, there are various ways that that we can can support um, these wonderful uh, initiatives, and in our own neighborhoods, supporting small businesses, neighborhood stores that we can walk to, helping our neighbors, helping our at-risk seniors, providing food for the elderly, checking up on the elderly. I saw something wonderful on the news the other day where I'm not sure where it was um, a gentleman who recently, I think he had turned 101 and his neighbors were out on the porch cheering him on and helping him out every day. Um, so it's, it's fantastic to see that shift um, of how vital our neighborhoods are, our neighbors and our immediate communities. Yes, yes, I agree. And I'm so glad you brought that up. And so to everyone listening, you know, I'm going to open this up in one in just one second, but exactly what Joanne and Martin alluded to, I wanted to quote um, an article that was in the New York Times that said uh, the title of the article was could the pandemic wind up fixing what's broken. And the quote that that came out that actually a friend of mine sent me was, um, we can do a lot more than we think we can. Crises are useful reminders, useful in a tragic kind of way, we're living through that, of what we can do if we wanted to, and if we had the will to do it. So emerging everyone here, while we're home, as Joanne said, and knowing that you have 
big institutional support um, to look at some of these uh, websites and links. And, and uh, while we have the time and the attention and the ear of our neighbors and our community um, to, to be a little more proactive. And um, with that, I'll go back to Liana to see if you want to field some questions. And anyone who wants, I have another poem for you at the very end. <laughs> Excellent, Wendy. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, there are a number of questions that have come in. I want to see if we can take them in a reasonable order. Um, let's talk about on the local level first, and then I'm going to bring it up a little higher. There were questions about um, what can we do to sort of address uh, the business community, not just the government, um, but to, to go to small businesses and those that are providing food and to help them recognize the relationship between um, food and health and healing on multiple levels. Is there anything from this experience in this moment now that that can help in that conversation? Uh, Joanne, you want to uh, address that? Yeah, um, I know that personally myself in supporting small businesses, um, I'm doing things like takeout from vegan restaurants because it hasn't been shown that anyone has actually contracted the virus from either a takeout or delivery service. So it's pretty much um, accepted that that's a safe way um, in order to, to get meals. So supporting local restaurants is important. Um, so many people now are exploring different recipes and, and how to cook with whole foods. And I think in your community, sharing the knowledge that you have about creating healthy meals is something that's important because that's been brought to, to the fore about, oh gosh, this is a virus, what we, can we do to protect ourselves? So I think more and more people are being motivated within their families to try to be more healthy and make healthier food choices. So I think that's, that's one thing to bring up. Uh. Well, thank you. So I, uh, I had the great good fortune to um, go and once visit Google uh, to see its food sustainability program. And this is the Google campus in Manhattan where they have seven, I think it is, food courts, not restaurants, actual courts where huge amounts of food is created and eaten. And they, being Google, have metricized everything down to the nth degree so that they can chart and test what is wasted and what is enjoyed and what is thrown away uh, and reused to reduce food waste. In the California branch, they even have their own brewery to take old coffee grinds, grains, old pieces of bread, and turn it into beer. Furthermore, they use brilliant architecture of choice aspects so that if you go to any one of the food lines in any one of the food courts, the first dishes that you will arrive at, including just the single dishes, rice, et cetera, will all be plant-based. So that by the time you get to the meat, you've already filled your plate full of five or six or seven different foods. And so therefore you are less likely to eat the meat because your plate is already full. And this kind of behavioral economics can be expanded across the entire business system. So that the meat is way at the back of the, court, the, the store instead of at the front, that the confection is removed and you get fruits and vegetables at the front of the store and by the concession thing, by, where, by the uh, register, et cetera. So I think we have an opportunity using Google in terms of the most big maximal store to reimagine how we serve food using architecture of choice, to reimagine how we really analyze which food is, is served and which isn't, to make sure that we close our systems when it comes to dealing with our food sources. So we have on-site composting or we have pick up compost. Unfortunately, given the crisis in the budget of New York City, it's likely that the brown bin collection that New York City has will be 
canceled. So there are going to be some severe budget cuts that will cause that to happen. But I think there are actually a lot of opportunities for businesses to be paid because of food services that they perform in terms of environmental services, including carbon sequestration, getting carbon credits for not throwing food away that would allow them to change the system. But this again, and I cannot emphasize enough, takes public policy. It takes municipalities passing legislation to stop this from happening, which is why something like, to not stop it from happening, but we're allowing it to happen. This is why that the good food purchasing program is so important. So I think we can work to ask our candidates what their positions are on food waste and, and business and what it can do to um, save on food uh, and how it can move towards a plant-based diet. That's where we need to push the envelope. And then ultimately there will be incentives to move towards a more uh, self-enclosed ecosystem of food in New York. Excellent, thank yeah. you. Thanks, Martin. And uh, there was an announcement, at least today I saw it, and a few others on on um, our call today have also seen it, that the brown bin composting program has been suspended uh, for quite a while. And I wonder, in addition, another person on our call said, um, you know, there are lots of the, lots of crops being plowed under. Of course, we've seen milk dumping, but there's also produce crops being plowed under since um, restaurants aren't purchasing in, at the same level that, that they have before. So what can we do about these things? Should we be rising up and trying to get our composting back and seeing where there are other ways to, you know, make the budget uh, work for us so that we can maintain a key piece of environmental uh, sustainability of our food system and or you know is there something we can do to salvage the crops or to to redirect them so um in terms of, of composting i mean it's i think it's so important that we begin in our homes in terms of asking ourselves what can we do because like you were saying martin about public policy we can't wait for the changes to happen at higher levels we need to do as much as we can uh, with with our own families, our own homes, with with how we produce our own food. So um, I'm not aware of other sorts of composting initiatives happening in New York since I don't live in New York. Maybe Martin, you have some thoughts about that. Uh, well, I live. I am very blessed. I live right near a farmers market. They've suspended the compost pickup. The compost would then go to the Gowanus. Uh, nursery where they do a whole range of composting. I'm also extremely privileged to have a backyard where I have three composters. So uh, I, I managed to compost a lot of food. I mean, I think, I think it's important to recognize that we have a system that wastes food from the outset. There's food loss and there's food waste, right? There's food that will be left to be plowed under because there's nobody to pick it. So we have an issue surrounding worker permits. We have the whole catastrophic issue of many people who grow our fruits and vegetables and pick them for us who are undocumented, who also have no recourse during this time of COVID-19. So that is a food justice issue that needs to be addressed. We have food so that the food work will rot in the fields because there's nobody to pick it. And then we have the issue of the fact that there is there are food choices made, right? We grow certain crops to feed to animals. That's a waste. If we grew food to feed to humans directly, we would have much less food that we would need to grow. So it, again, it needs public policy to shift the system. But on a personal level, I think ugly food, which I've just posted the link to, is essential. This is food that just doesn't make it into the, uh, into the stores because the apples are shaped mis weirdly and the carrots are shaped in a funny way. And, all the stuff that is the cosmetics of food that uh, are being um, are not being taken care of. But support the CSA, support your farmers market, support um, vertical farming. Find ways to find local community growers who are doing their thing. So I would I would uh, I would su suggest you search for that food. I think what's also interesting is, and I think this is clearly the case, is that people recognize that food growers are themselves part of the service economy. And I think hopefully there will be a, a real effort to recost food so that it's the proper price is paid for it, which will go back to the workers and make sure that when we think of a farmer, 
we don't just think of a 55 to 60 year old white guy growing corn or ranching animals in Wyoming, but we think of the 55 to 60 year old black woman immigrant who's growing food for her community in the Bronx to give them access to healthy food because they can't find it in their local environment. She's a farmer just as much as the other guys are farmers. She may be growing specialty crops, but she, and she's not a real farmer because she's not growing commodity crops, but we need to rethink what it means to support farmers. She may not own the land, he may own the land, but they're all growing food. So that's, I think, another orientation that we should have to shift our perspective there. And another thing too is that about 63% of government subsidies actually go to the meat and dairy industries. So we need to shift that idea so that we're actually supporting the farmers who are growing fruits and vegetables. That's going to be so critical. I was just reading, um, I'm sure a lot of you have have eaten Miyoko Shinner's wonderful cheese products. She's actually doing this fantastic thing where she's contacting local farmers who in the past have raised livestock and convincing them or urging them to grow plant products like potatoes and legumes, which then she will use to help create her plant-based cheeses. So showing that, um, you know, you can repurpose and redirect what you're doing as a farmer to creating healthy, sustainable food. And, and she's one of, of, of many fantastic entrepreneurs who are really changing the landscape of what farming is and what food is. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of potential for exciting things to happen. Excellent. More questions, Liana? Yes. Um Peter asks a big question here, and I want to add on to it as well. Um, there's, do you think this pandemic will be enough to overcome big ag and end factory farming? And my my append, appendage to that would be, um, will it be enough to prove that we need to be eating healthier and living healthier lifestyles so that we can prevent these underlying conditions that cause us to be um to succumb to viruses like these? Obviously, I think we all know that the answer is no, but my question is where have you seen it on the agenda, if anywhere, for our leaders to be able to recognize the origin, not just the origins of disease, um, but also these sort of weak links in our food system and our health systems? Um, where are there bright spots that we might latch on to? Take it away, Andrea. <laughs> I personally haven't seen the kind of large scale changes that we need. For instance, this uh, talk about the pork uh, slaughterhouses that had to close down because of COVID-19 spreading among the workers. And there's the concern, how are we going to regain the capacity to raise pork? So there's this like enormous blind spot that I think, you know, people just don't see it, like um, you had mentioned before, this separation between, oh, there's the wild animals, they were the ones that caused, you know, the origins of the virus, but that per perceptually people still overall, I don't think are making the connection that is su just as damaging and critical with what the pandemic and, and pathogenic um, damage that's possible, that's going to happen, through industrial factory farming. Um, of course, those of us in the vegan community, of course we see the connection, but I think that the public humanity, humans in general, we tend to make change very slowly. Um, and I'm not totally confident that a large percentage will will make this realization and go plant-based and put into action plans that will change this whole way that we produce food. Um, I wish I could be more optimistic, but I, I think people are just too eager to get back to the way they lived before. That's kind of my initial take on it. Martin? All right, I'm gonna be wildly speculative here, and I'm gonna give you various <laughs> various different scenarios. There will be a massive push 
from corporate agriculture in the wake of this pandemic to move all agriculture indoors in order to sustain the notion that somehow an, in, an inside uh, hermetically sealed biosecure place where animals are farmed extremely intensively will be safer in terms of pan pandemic disease than open air markets or small medium sized uh, factory farms which may be open to the elements and i think there will be a push for what will be called sustainable intensification also as a way of mitigating climate change as a way to control the animals feeding and watering habits and stop their green and lower their greenhouse gas emissions there'll be a push for that and that's what corporate agriculture will want however that same corporate agriculture has two things that are working to undermine it the first thing is is that many of them are already investors in cultivated meat products uh, in cultivated meat technology and plant-based meat technology so with the uh, solutions that may be found to cultivated or cellular meat that might in some ways undercut the need for them to invest even further in a system that no matter how you look at it is incredibly uh, dirty incredibly resource intensive in favor of something that's clean and produces the same product in fact a recent report from an organization called rethink x which i've just put the link to on the in the chat has an extraordinary notion that by 2030 because of the arrival because of the growth of interest in plant-based meat and dairy and the solutions to the various technological issues that are stopping cultivated meat and dairy from uh, taking off or being implemented at all will be solved and that factory farming will essentially be half what it is by 2030 and that by 2035 intensive animal agriculture of any kind of any animal will be functionally impossible because there'll be no money in it at all and in fact the only animals that will be harvested quote unquote harvested grown and harvested will be specialty animals animals that are sort of heritage breeds and it'll be an artisanal activity and that this will happen extremely quickly and the collapse will be within the, the collapse will begin within the next few years now you can look at that and say that is totally pie in the sky but boy oh boy do they make a persuasive case for why it is now why do they think that it's because essentially and this is the third element the farmers who supply the widgets that are the animals that make up the factory farming uh, ecosystem are dying they're killing themselves they're going out of business they cannot sustain themselves you have massive massive discontent within all of the farmers that exist to produce commodity cops to a system for which they earn pennies on the dollar there's nothing in it for them they would be much better off growing hemp or mushrooms or something else where the the, um, the value added to your product is so much higher so that is part and parcel of what the mercy for animals and miyoko skinner is doing with the transformation program and a whole range of other programs if that program if those programs became part and parcel of governmental policy whether perhaps through the good food purchasing program because boy oh boy if new york city decides it wants to have, get more fruits and vegetables and have fewer animal products it's going to need to employ virtually the entire food shed of the of the uh, new england area in order to supply that so what are the farmers going to do they're going to be subsidized in order to shift over so that they stop growing meat and dairy which nobody wants anymore to grow food that people actually are, that, that governments are asking them to buy to give their kids in schools or to give prisoners in, in and hospitals etc there is another opportunity so we've got three opportunities you've got a, uh, an industry that could go all in for intensive farming you could have an industry that will just be undermined by its own commitments and investments in either plant-based or cultivated meat or you could have an industry that simply has farmers who simply don't want to be part of it anymore because the they can earn much more money elsewhere and all three are extremely possible very quickly sounds like good news to me um liana yes thank you martin you leave us with such an interesting vision and one that we can only hope i mean can hope for one one great scenario to come our way. Um, I think you know to put this in context, just to say that um, those of us who have 
adopted a plant-based lifestyle for whatever reason, um, to be able to make these connections and to see the whole and to recognize that there are so many alternatives forward, um, you know, it's even more incumbent upon us, I believe, to use our voices and to do something with it. So I wanna thank Martin and Joanne in particular for being those leaders already in the field and for inspiring uh, those of us who have more to give to do it and to see the possibilities. Um, I'll make a few closing announcements, but um, Wendy, would you like to share some closing words first? Uh, well, just huge thanks to both Martin and Joanne. Um, it really illuminates the the larger and wider scope. You've definitely opened opened the aperture as uh, as we promised, and um, really love that you talked about um, the the healing side of this too. The healing for person for. Uh, community, ideally for a uh, nation and world, um, the optimist that I am. Um, I'll also just leave you with one stanza, not the whole poem as promised from uh, W.H. Auden's Leap Before You Look. This is for the community. It, it, he starts the poem, you can finish it on your own. The sense of danger must not disappear. The way is certainly both short and steep. However gradual it looks from here, look if you like but you will have to leap and he goes further because of time i will not read the rest but um enjoy the poem and i hope you've enjoyed the evening and joanna martin thank you and liana uh back to you excellent so i want to thank all of you for joining us this evening and just make a reminder about our ongoing web series you are all invited to join us as we continue to explore many different angles of plant-based nutrition on Wednesday evening, we will be having a culinary demo of South Indian food. On Thursday, we'll be speaking with Victoria Moran about her weight loss story and what we can learn about thinking about plant-based living as not a, a lifestyle of deprivation, but one of abundance. And, um, and we continue with many other um, programs. So please join us, take a look at our website uh, where you can join us for more. And if you're not already on our website, please feel free to join us um, on our homepage. You'll find a link to do that. Um, and with that, uh, I want to encourage you to take the, these ideas and to think about them as you fall asleep tonight um, and consider what will you do next? What will we each of us do next? And perhaps what can we all do together uh, to make healing happen at, at many levels of society at this very challenging time. Um, so have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for joining us.